So in our classrooms, when we write notes to kids on their work, and there's a, kind of some back and forth through writing or dialogue journals, that's interpersonal communication through writing. Um, then there's interpretive communication, where the, the kids are getting sort of an extended text, either orally or in writing without a back and forth that they have to make meaning of. So students had to understand my directions or little lectures and explanations where they had to listen to me talk for a while and make sense of what I was saying. Um, and then in writing, interpretive communication was all the different kinds of reading that they were having to do. Um, then the flip side of interpretive communication is presentational communication where the students then have to produce an extended chunk of text. Um, and so if they had done a presentation, like a PowerPoint, then that would have been oral presentational communication. For this project, the presentational communication was just in writing, that they wrote these individual reports about either the extraction, production, distribution, consumption, or disposal of the product. That they <laughs> so there was a lot of language and literacy embedded in here. Um, and then that leads us to attention where on the one hand there was a lot of content for my students to learn about trade and both science and social studies kind of content and I needed space for them to really understand that content and then on the other hand I wanted them to get practice with formal academic language and formal writing I wanted them to learn how to write informational text um, and these often come into tension because we have a limited amount of time in our classrooms right so we're both trying to teach science and trying to teach them how to write a formal write up of their experiment, for example. Um, as a result of dealing with this tension, and sometimes not very well in my classroom, this is the kind of stuff that I've seen, and um, this may be familiar to some of you. Sometimes I see kids just parroting back the model that I did without really understanding. So we do a little shared writing, here's an example of what your informational text could look like. And then I get the same thing back, and I don't really know if they really understood the content. Or I see a lot of students writing unclearly, and I don't know if they didn't understand the content that they were supposed to write about, or maybe they did understand the content, but they just couldn't write about it clearly in English. Um, also, just limited opportunities for the students to make meaning at all what they're learning and doing in school, so that their writing really feels like it's theirs. Um, and then last, relying too much on sentence frames and templates to do the writing for them. Right? So I don't really have time to teach you how to write this kind of essay. So I'm going to give you a template where it's all framed out for you and you just fill in the blanks. And you never learn how to really do that kind of writing. Um, because I don't have the time, so I'm kind of trying to cram it all in. Um, so here's an example of what I got from that project that illustrates this tension. Uh, one of the kids was writing about disposal. She had been studying t-shirts. And I'll just read a little bit of the writing. It's really an example of that unclear writing, where I think she wasn't given enough opportunities to make meaning of the content before I asked her to do this sort of academic writing about it. So did you know that there are some positive ways to recycle your t-shirt? 10% reduction in the production of trash. That means 10% of our clothes don't go to the trash. Also, 67% are increasing donations in stores. That means that people are donating instead of throwing it away. And then later on, she's checking most clothes are repaired, mended, and tailored to fit families, recycle them as rugs and quilt. So there's an example of kind of a, I think she cobbled together things she lifted from the internet with, in some cases, her own words. In some of her rephrasings, I do see she understands what she wrote, in other places she doesn't. And I think this is really the product of she didn't get enough opportunities to understand what she had to write about before I was like, right. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is a framework that was developed by Pauline Gibbons, who's a researcher in Australia, where they've done a lot of interesting work with language learners. Um, and it's called the mode continuum, and I think it's helpful both in thinking about our teaching but also important to think about when we analyze data from our students. And the mode continuum is based on a concept from linguistics called register. Register is um, just the fact that the way we use language varies depending on the situation that we're in, which is something we all know naturally as adults who are confident in using language. We don't talk to everybody the same way, and we don't talk the same way in all situations. 
And linguists have found that language varies depending on the relationship between the speaker and the listener, or the writer and the reader. <coughs> depends also on the subject matter that we're talking about, and it depends on the channel of communication or the mode, whether we're writing or whether we're speaking, right? So if I'm um, talking to my two-year-old daughter, that's not the way that I would talk to my principal. <laughs> Or if I'm sending an email to my friend about her new baby, and that's not the same kind of email that I would send to the district to complain about something. <laughs> um, and this is um, kind of the way we can look at the mode continuum. It is a continuum, so it's not saying language is either this or that, but it falls along a spectrum. So um, there's some language that's really informal and spoken, some that's much more formal and written, and then a lot of languages in between. And we move across this sort of naturally as adults, and we move, and our students have to move across this continuum in the school day. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of language that would fall on the other side of this continuum. Um, this is a, a couple little excerpts of kids that were talking about a science book. Um, for my dissertation, I worked with fourth grade students. Uh, teaching a small reading group and analyzing their use of language in the group to try to understand what academic language was, to try to understand how did kids grapple with difficult science texts that were in Spanish, and how did they use oral language to make sense of that. Um, so we were reading about electricity, and we had done a little experiment where we taken an aluminum strip instead of a wire, it's a cheaper way to get a wire, and a light bulb and a battery, and had made a basic um, circuit so they could see how it turned on. And then we went to the book we were reading and tried to understand how this worked. And so one of the students, Amy, found this in the quote that she found in the book that she thought could help us understand how the light bulb turned on. She said, the circulating current will turn on the light bulb in the flashlight. And then she tried to rephrase it. That's why it, like, it's like that um, the light bulb turns on, because it is circulating. So I was like, okay. Do you know what circulating means? Yeah. And then Roberto, one of her classmates, was really quick and was like, but what? What's the it? You know, and he really got on her. Let's read, when you write, people aren't going to understand what the it is. You have to explain what you're talking about. And so the kids went back and forth. Amy went back to the text and found another sentence she thought could help us. She said, electricity can circulate through the aluminum strip. And then she went, oh, like electricity, like it was like this, then it goes like this, then it got over here like this. And she gestured to show um, what had happened. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do now is to think about this language that Amy said at the end, which really embodies that informal spoken, like this, like this, like this. And then the language that she was reading from the textbook, which is really that formal written language. And to just talk to somebody next to you for a couple of minutes about what do you notice that's different between the language on the left side and the language on the right side. And then we'll share out.
describe the language on either side of the continuum. I saw on the left side that there was a lack of um, action verb. Goes was her verb. The action verb is not present in the spoken, it's present in the gestures that she's making. Mm -hmm. So you have to see her speaking. Right. Um, we were just talking about how maybe if she had the vocabulary, even in her informal sort of spoken, she would have inserted those in there. So the, this and that, the pronouns wouldn't be as frequent. Uh -huh. But that, that's sort of more like she's trying to figure out what she's seeing and what's happening. So before she has the vocabulary also, it sort of becomes more this and that and gestures. Okay. Uh -huh. I think in one day, you know, I grappled with this a lot. Like, uh, what is the academic discussion? Is it getting the concept or is it being able to parrot the vocabulary that you're given? Mm -hmm. So which is actually more powerful? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a very good uh -huh. I think they're both important. I think they have to understand the concept first. And then once they've understood the concept, that's fine if it continues to be informal until the point where they are required to make it formal. And that's where they need the tools to make it formal. Mm -hmm. And on the right side, the sentences are complete sentences. Um, and, and on the left, they're sort of a, it's a stream of processing. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about, I just noticed the difference that on the right-hand side of the written, there's, there's a noun in there. There's current to substitute for it. So there's, once you have a noun, you have a concept, and a bunch of things all connected to it. And I'm, 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 I'm unclear about in the spoken, when she says the combination of the gesture and it, is the concept the same, or is the concept there, in the same way that it is there once she's using the noun? Um, so you all are going to where we're going to go next. Um, so just to confirm so it, right, she's using this, what linguists call um, dictative terms, this, that, instead of nouns, which we would have in formal writing. Um, and then her verbs are embodied in her gestures, right? Whereas here she's, in, if it was formal written language, the verbs, all of that would have to be communicated in the writing. Um, and this makes sense because speaking and writing are really different activities. So when we speak, in some ways it's easier because we have that shared face-to-face -face context. So if Amy says like this, like this, like this, we can understand her because we're there, or we could say what's the this, what's the that. We could go back and forth with her. When we look at formal academic writing, there is no shared, or even any writing, there isn't that shared context, so the author needs to be more explicit in the language, it needs to stand more on its own. On the other hand, speech can be more difficult. You know, oftentimes we think, oh, speech to writing. But speech is difficult because it's in the moment. And so kids have to, you know, what can I say in the moment? And even as adults, we don't have the time when we speak to find all of those complex nouns or precisely the right verb. Um, and um, folks who have analyzed language use across the continuum find that even with adults, we don't really speak in full sentences. You know, we tell kids, give me that in a full sentence, but we don't really talk in full sentences. We talk in closets, kind of da 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 You know, because we don't have the time to, um, to process in the same way that we do when we write. When we write, we have that time to revise, to find the precise noun that we want to use, or the precise verb, and to create more complex sentences. Yeah. It also just made me think that there are maybe certain concepts that are better explained through gesture. Like I've seen, um, I saw an interview once with adults where they, the interviewer asked people to explain a spiral with words. And people started to say, well, and they like started to say something that everybody ended up just doing this, <laughs> you know, adults. So that they kind of, yeah, not that one is valued more than the other, but like there are contexts in which each one has its value, you know, so teaching kids to be, to like, to have all of the capacities so that they can choose the one that's the most appropriate for them. Yeah. I also say, I mean, the last slide, that, that written text, 
the last piece said the, the current will circulate through the aluminum strip, which suggests that in this book there's like a picture of the experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not as if that formal written text is totally unreliant on, on visual cues. Right. There was, and the experiment that we had done was taken right out of the book, and there was the picture. Um, and folks that have talked about, well, academic language is decontextualized, have said, you know, it's really not, because it also relies on all this context that the reader brings, right? Um, and what happens often with students is they don't bring the context that's expected of them, and then they can struggle to understand it. But it's not that the writing itself is decontextualized, it's assuming that kids have a certain kind of background knowledge and context to bring to it. Um, and so, moving into what a lot of you have said, that informal language is really important when we want students to understand, right? So, and a lot of times we dichotomize informal language and academic language. I would argue that all of it, that whole mode continuum is academic language. It's all serving, if you think about language as an action, all of that language is serving an academic purpose. So, Amy being able to say like this, like this, like this, shows to me more comprehension of the idea of a circuit than when she's parroting back stuff from the text. Um, and so that informal language, I think, is really purposeful, really important when we're having kids grapple with complex texts in the way that the Common Core Standards wants us to do. Um, because it allows students to develop comprehension and to show comprehension. Um, so thinking about our teaching then, um, we think about how we're moving across and we're asking our students to move across this continuum throughout the school day. So they have to read these academic texts but then being able to use informal language to make sense of those texts is really valuable. And then to be able to move back over to the formal written side. Um, so thinking about, you know, we may ask kids to read a text and we may say, talk to your partner, and it's going to be more on that side. Then we may have to <coughs> share out, and then that's going to be moving a little more to the right. It's going to sound a little bit more formal. Um, and then looking at examples of writing and then writing themselves. Um, and our researcher at Stanford, um, George Bunch, actually at UC Santa Cruz, has talked about this in terms of the language of ideas and the language of display. So he says that that informal language, he analyzed um, group work in middle school history classrooms, and said that informal language is really the language of ideas. Students are using that language to support their meaning making and to work in groups. And then when they get ready to present out, that's the language of display. That's where they're translating those ideas into more precise explanations. But when he analyzed kids working in groups, he saw that when they moved really quickly into that, how am I going to say this in front of the class, it shut down the meaning making and the intellectual work in the group and the opportunity for everybody in the group to understand what they were learning. Um, and so connecting back to that example of the stu my student's writing that I showed you, I think that that unclear writing was a, a cause of not having the opportunity to deal with the language of ideas and understand what she was writing about before I pushed her into writing. Um, so when I think about this in my teaching, I really try to be strategic about providing experiences for my students across the mode continuum. So there's space to make sense of reading, to make sense of content, then to read models of formal writing, to orally present their ideas and to move toward more formal writing. Um, and being really careful about how I bridge from informal to formal language. So being explicit with my students about the difference between informal and formal language and giving them time to analyze what formal writing looks like before I ask them to just write. And then naturally what we do a lot when we talk to children is recasting their language for them. So we're affirming the ideas that they give us but then we're also modeling how that might sound in a more academic way. And, I'm gonna, um, and I think with the Common Core Standards, they really have um, affirmed this view of language by emphasizing academic discussion as something that's valuable across the grade levels and in different content areas. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples in different content areas. Um, this is thinking about science. So Colleen Gibbons has done a lot of work in elementary school science. And um, I think has a really thoughtful way of thinking about how you would sequence instruction to take advantage of the mode continuum for students' language and content learning. So she starts with having students conduct an experiment. Kids are doing, you know, working with magnets or circuits, and you're going to get a lot of that informal language, right? Put it here, look at that, what's happening? 
but that's where students are making meaning of the science content. Then she moves to introducing the vocabulary after that. So they've dealt with the concepts, and then the words are just being attached to those concepts. Um, and then moving into having the kids report out on their experience with some teacher recasting, some teacher prompting, and then finally journal writing. And what I think is really thoughtful about what she does is instead of having all the kids do the same experiment, because then, like, you did the same thing as me, I don't, I'm not really interested in listening to what you say, because I did the same thing. Right? Um, she has students doing different experiments, but then they're going to rotate. So the next day, I'm going to have to do your experiments, so then I'm a little bit more bought into listening to you and how you made your whatever magnetic thing, because I'm going to have to figure out that challenge. Um, an example from social studies, after I had done this project with the kids with the maps and got this kind of garbled, unclear writing, um, the next stage of my project was for kids to think about fair trade and whether the products that they had studied were fair trade. So that meant looking at these kind of legalistic documents of what, is, what are fair trade standards, um, which was challenging content for the students, and going back to reading informational text about how their products had been created and deciding whether that met fair trade standards. So this time I tried to be a lot more thoughtful about the sequence of activities to make sure the students were supported across the mode continuum with that one piece of content. Um, so we started with reading these fair trade standards, so number one, and I had kids work in groups to translate fair trade, stand fair trade standards into regular speech. Right? Fair trade standards talk about collective bargaining, harassment, things that are challenging concepts for students. Um, then we moved back to their research sources that they had read before, but this time with the purpose of looking for evidence, does this meet fair, a definition of fair trade or not? And they created little note takers that then they brought into a fishbowl discussion. So then that discussion became a little more formal than a pair share because kids had prepped for it and they had notes so they could give more extended talk. Um, then they reflected on the fishbowl discussion in ways that would help them move into their writing. So what's something someone said that you agree with? Why? What's something someone said you disagree with and why? To help them start thinking about a counter-argument. Um, then we brainstormed what are the pieces of an argumentative essay based on their experience writing that before. Then number six, all the way on that side, again, they were put in groups and they talked informally to create an outline of what an argumentative essay would be like. So instead of me giving them an outline or giving them a template to fill in, they had to think, well, how would I logically organize an essay? Um, and then they created their own outlines and then um, we analyzed models of argumentative essay and taught little mini lessons as they were writing to deconstruct what is this academic genre. So, um, as a result, the writing that the kids did showed to me that they understood the content better. Um, it's not perfect, so I'll point that out. This is and it's the same student that we looked at at the beginning, the beginning of her essay about whether she thought the t-shirts that she studied were fair trade. It's just her draft without any editing. Um, she says, have you ever thought, uh, where does your t-shirt is made and are they paid fairly or treated? Mighty Fine t-shirt products are designed in LA and are sold in major stores to consumers in the US. If your product is fair trade, it means there are safe working conditions, no child labor, no discrimination, abuse, and harassment. It also means that employees are paid equally and paid enough to live. I believe Mighty Fine t-shirts is not fair trade because cotton is bad for workers' health and workers are not paid well. And then this paragraph is about the cotton industry and she has quotes about <coughs> pesticides and then at the end of that paragraph is able to explain that some pesticides can cause cancer, birth defects, and are toxic to fishes and birds. This means cotton is dangerous for workers who are exposed to chemicals that are not safe conditions because they can cause cancer. And then talks about the, her second reason because mm -hmm. of um, sweatshop conditions and then a little counter argument. Um, so the writing I saw from students made more sense. It showed to me that they had understood this complex content a little more clearly. Um, and then I wanted to end by thinking about what are the implications of thinking about the mode continuum for our analysis of data. So just to be really careful that when we collect data from students, 
that we remember what the context was in which they did that talking or that writing, and that we analyze the data in a way that's <coughs> representative of that, um, and thinking what's appropriate for the context or the purpose. So if I'm analyzing students' discussion in a reading group, and my goal there is for them to understand science content, it probably doesn't make sense for my indicators for success to be, are they speaking in complete sentences? Right, so really when we start to analyze our data and come up with indicators for success and clarify what our learning goals are, that we are aware of where that data is situated across the motor continuum and what makes sense um, given the context. Does anybody have any questions? Um, so this is really interesting in terms of the progression of these students reaching mastery and what you're calling it on the far side, formal speech or formal writing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's for a science teacher. It reminds me of these learning progressions that are the new thing about teaching is through science instruction and then there's this way to take them through learning that starts some smaller, simpler, but more complex. Um, so I'm curious about your thinking. What I find like in the best case scenario where I have a learning progression like you're describing, where I know where the kids gotta go, well, I think I know. Yeah. Sort of this step-by-step -step process that you're describing, like with those numbers that you put one through eight or whatever they were. Um, so given that you go through all the work to get that, which is a lot of work, it seems like the really complicated work is after that, when you've got these eight steps and you've got 30 kids, and assessing where are each of them, where do they need to be, and how do we get them to the next step mm -hmm. when they're all over the board. Mm -hmm. um, I know I just said a lot. What like so taking this to the next step, I'm just curious what you're thinking is about differentiating it. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think because kids are all different places in terms of content and language, right? So I may and I may think you know, for me right now, I'm really focusing on, because also, if, if they don't have the content solid, so I try to prioritize, like, you need to understand what you're gonna write about before you're gonna write, so thinking, you know, if they, going back, sort of, if I'm getting stuff that's looking unclear earlier on, to give more spaces to work with students to clarify that content before moving there. And then just knowing where different kids are and where I want to push them. But I think for me, it's been helpful with Mills to have kids that are strong kids that I'm looking at as my focal students because before I would focus a lot on those lower students. I always did my research on where the students were struggling and how can I understand what's going on for them, which I think is really valuable. But I think when we also have those stronger kids, it pushes them more too and it pushes me to serve them more instead of having. Yeah. But if, I mean, basically, I mean, I think it's one of those things where it's like you might give, like for me, I'll get, I'll sort of talk about our projects, and then I have one kid who comes in the next day, he's like, I'm done, and I'm like, but we haven't even, we haven't even started, you know, it's like, no, and like, it's not very good, and they're like, no, but I'm done, my story's done, you know, or whatever, and like, isn't it kind of like, um, there is a way that like in a classroom, we kind of just all have to follow these steps so that we can kind of learn it and internalize it so that hopefully in high school, they're starting to like, make sense of how those steps work for them. Maybe, like, hopefully they don't all have to outline together. You know, like they're, they're doing some of those things on their own, but just for the process of sixth grade or seventh grade, we all just kind of have to go through these steps as we all go through them together, even if you think you don't need them. I don't know, or, or is that not a, I don't know, I mean, that's not true. I think, and I think, but I think even for adults, we go through, I mean, we know how to control our process, our learning and writing processes, but we also go through these steps mm -hmm. as we produce work, right? So, like, I wrote a dissertation, and it's just like, yeah, you know? Like, I had to talk with people, I had to write stuff, I go through, you know, and have discussions and courses that then enabled me to do that. So we don't automatically go there either. No. Um, it makes me it makes me feel a little crazy sometimes when I think that I have to be responsible for differentiating for each single student, um, and yet so so it makes 
me wonder, isn't there a way to have the students keep track of where they need to be working so that they're, so I teach high school, so having them begin to be more aware of where they need to work and improve. And so it makes me think um, that it would be a good idea perhaps for that to have, to have a folder and a chart of the same rubric that I'm grading them on and then where they are at that for each assignment and then be, be able to say, okay, this is where I need to improve and that they are then initiating that improvement based on where their folder says they are. Mm -hmm. So that each rubric they get back, okay, you're still stuck on working on these, okay, this needs to be where I need to focus so that there's more conversation back and forth between me as a student and the student's evaluations and I'm not directing all of their individual assignments because that's too hard to do. They get the same assignment, but they may be working at a different level based on where they're keeping track, where they're improving. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think my comment bears a little bit off the topic right now, but it's just what's in my head. When I look at this and I think about what you said about the language of display, it's kind of making me think about, in, in a certain way as a teacher, we think about that formal written language as like the end product. But now I'm like, that's not the end product, that's the display product. The end product is actually number one. Well, that's what I really want kids to have, is the ability to say what the idea is in a way that makes sense. And I'm thinking about the speech I had, we were reading this complex text by a writer, and at the end he was like, I think this writer is just trying to say that the man is a show-off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but he went all the way to the language of display just to get all the way back to number one. So it's like a shift in my thinking that what I really want students to have is number one. But I want them to be able to do the, the display. But that means a whole different kind of organization in the way I think about the use of language. Because it's like, yeah, this is what you're going to display. But fundamentally, I want you to be able to understand, but I need you to be able to do both. But I think that also shifts my ability to think about power and equity. Because some kids struggle with the language of display. But they have every single idea, and we often don't value that. So that's really, that was really in my brain. Right, yeah, and I think sometimes it's making it explicit to kids that what I'm asking you to do right now is to display. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, you know, when you like test young kids and they don't understand like why you're asking me a question that you don't know the answer to. <laughs> So um, to point out to kids that like it's a lot of this is about display. You have to pretend I didn't read this text, but that's the game that we're going to play in school. Um, but I really want you to understand. I think we have time for one more question. Michelle, Michelle has. Um, yeah, this just has me thinking a lot about assessment and the way that we assess kids is ultimately formal, but how. You know, and that gets us to that point you had of deficit, you know, and seeing our kids with their deficit, that, you know, that, uh, from that perspective. And what a shift it could be, you know, for me, if I'm really, like, recording the informal stage and, and, and using that more as the way that I assess kids as opposed to that informal. So I passed out cards to people about what question you have that you'd like to continue on hearing about next time, and we hope that you will come back in January and talk to us again. So uh, clearly there's a lot of people here with a lot of questions. Write down your questions, and that will help, uh, help Laura and help us figure out what the next direction is, what the next step is that you're talking about.